this video, I'm going to be interpreting my first act of imagination, which I encourage you to watch first if you haven't already, and I've placed a card on the upper right which has the link in it for you. This was my first act of imagination, and going into it, I had no idea what to expect or even if anything at all would happen. I'm by nature a skeptical person, so honestly, was it just a bunch of psycho hoo-ha or was there something to it? Well, obviously, I found out that there is something to it. And as for my technique for doing active imagination, I'm going to be doing a video very soon about that, actually, which hopefully will answer all of your questions. I'd like to state before we get started that this will be an ongoing theme for my channel, and hopefully I'm going to have at least one active imagination related video uploaded per week, if not two. One will definitely be the, you know, the transcript itself what you have in front of you right now. And of course I dramatize those. I try to add in the sound effects. I tried painting actually like what I saw, but I'm, I'm just so terrible that I can't. <laughs> and obviously like stock footage isn't going to do justice to what I saw. So I try to like, I try to make it as immersive as I can with the sound effects, um, like describing the imagery so that you can kind of like enter into what I'm, what I was experiencing at the time. So I currently actually, I currently have about a dozen sessions transcribed. I guess we could call them sessions transcribed from my handwritten notes. And there's several more that await transcription. So I've got about maybe 15 or 16 sessions and I've done this over the last few months, this being my first one. And each of those will have a video like the first one. And hopefully it's edifying for you. There's a lot of questions about it I've seen on YouTube. There's a lot of vagueness about how to do it. There's a lot of vagueness about what it actually is supposed to accomplish. And I might actually also do a video about, you know, what Jung says it's actually supposed to do. How are we supposed to benefit from this? So let's get started. I want to share a little background. At the time, I was working a tedious, soul sucking corporate job. In addition to that, life had taken us including my wife, by the collar. This entire year had taken, had taken us by the collar, so to speak. I was really doing some soul-searching. And then my reading list, which, you know, is heavily backlogged, just because you can only listen. I, I listen to things. I don't read. I listen to audiobooks. And I've explained elsewhere why I do that. It's just, it works for me. But anyway, so I had finally arrived at Young's Works in my reading list. And I started by listening to a bunch of his interviews, which I had bookmarked. I listened to several of his essays, because he wrote a lot of things. I think I listened to the one about UFOs that he did later in his life. I listened to his collected works. That's, that's where you should start, I think. It's like the most basic layout of how he has basically systematized all of his observations, all of his clinical and professional and academic experience. He kind of condenses all of that and systematizes it into collected works. And then I finally listened to the entirety of his Red Book, the Audible version. So active imagination immediately became apparent to me as a way to more fully understand the stress and the inner conflict that I was going through. I relate to Jung both not only his thinking, but also as a person. I get his personality. Like he was a he was an intuitive, pensive type, which is that describes me very well, too. This act of imagination, compared with the later ones, which I'm extremely excited to be sharing those, it seems to have had kid gloves on, so to speak. It addressed a very basic, very simple conflict within me that came as a result of my job, namely my love of nature and the outdoors. And that love was stymied by my job, which basically had me chained to a desk for nine and ten hours a day, six days a week. And it was as if, by this act of imagination, my subconscious was making a gentle, friendly introduction. It's like it was just taking my hand and shaking it nicely and calmly and saying, Hi, you know, I'm here. You know, this is me. Welcome, welcome. Rather than immediately taking me into the depths of my unconscious. By its very nature, the unconscious is, I mean, it has a, an aura of mystery, and I, it should have, if we conceive of it rightly, it should have an aura of fear. 
and that it's totally unknown and it's different and it's not i mean that's that's what it is by nature it's not something we experience consciously and yet there it is just as sentient just as real as our conscious minds of note in this act of imagination also is the introduction of the term eden and its imagery those are referenced later they continue throughout my further active imaginations and it's it's probably one of the central themes that i experience that my subconscious makes aware to me and expresses itself through so i have the transcript here taken directly from my handwritten notes and i'd like to just take you through it so this is basically i after i'm done writing and i transcribe it i basically give the you know the summary topics like the tags of it there's the farmer peace is a theme eden is a theme this is simply the invitation to my subconscious and this this i get from robert johnson's book inner work where he recommends that i don't know if it's really necessary or not but it's basically expressing to your subconscious like you're coming to it on equal terms you know it's a part of you and yet it's it has its own desires it faces its own set of challenges it faces its own difficulties just as we do consciously and you're basically inviting it to speak inviting it to communicate and i'm going to probably do some videos later what is the difference between active imagination and say meditation what is the difference between active imagination and channeling they're different they're very different but i just want to make clear there is a distinction there <laughs> like you're not inviting anything to talk to you you're specifically speaking to yourself recognizing that it is yourself so i just make that invitation it's basically recognizing that there is a part of you that feels and thinks and while it's part of you at the same time it's distinct and, and i guess an illustration of this would be your dreams you know your dreams if you really listen and you examine them it's as if there's some other part of you that's you know it has its own personality in a certain sense it has its own feelings and it's trying to get you to see those things see what troubles it and get you to face those and the invitation is basically just recognizing that part of you that is yet distinct yet part of you and basically saying i want to i want reconciliation i want the conflict to cease i want peace so this started out and i'll go over technique in another video but basically i closed my eyes clearing my mind kind of starting the daydream kind of in the sense that you're letting your mind wander and yet you're still fully conscious it's hard to describe that's the best i can do to describe it right now in such a brief time but eventually an image came to me and it wasn't the first image that came to my mind but it was the one that was the clearest and it was the one that really stuck out and and it just stuck in my mind so i thought well maybe this is the image maybe maybe this is the scene that the subconscious is beginning to to weave and to create in my mind i look up i'm just kind of you know doing what young did you know he just kind of enters into the scene as it unfolds so i'm trying initially i'm trying to explore i look up i see the cloudy sky i see the flock of birds i see the field of corn which i guess i didn't note here in my notes but there was a field of corn and we were kind of on a dirt road that ran left to right and i'm facing the corn and there's a wooden fence and the sun's behind the field of corn and it's low in the sky kind of nearing like sunset maybe even more like dusk but it was still a little bit light out the sky was still bluish and then this haggard tall old farmer approaches me and i'm trying to see like what time is this you know like what what era is this from and as with future active imaginations i can't really tell but it's like there's a it's like it's not from the present but it's not like from antiquity it's not necessarily the middle ages 
but it's just an older time. He has a pitchfork, he has straw hat, he has overalls on, but he didn't look like a hillbilly or anything like this. He just kind of looks like an older, haggard farmer. And, you know, I did the New Age documentary, which I'll link up in the upper right as well. I did that documentary and became very familiar with the demonic, not necessarily with personal practice or seeking communication. But I just want to just say, without revealing too much, that I just, I understood the demonic. And the communications people receive, you know, from entities and from even with like UFO experiences. And so I was wondering, you know, is this going to turn into something like that? You know, because the farmer was ugly. There was an element of the grotesque about his appearance. You know, his face was wrinkled. He just kind of st stared at me without expression. I couldn't really detect his disposition. He comes from my left along, along the dirt road next to the wooden fence, which is obviously like handmade. It was rough hewn, like split wood. So I just asked him, you know, I was thinking, this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to talk to these characters that appear in your mind, you know, like in a daydream, except rather than just seeing the fantasies unfold, you enter into them. You don't control what happens an active imagination, but nevertheless, you are consciously involved, and you're even involved to the point of speaking, looking around, speaking to these characters. And by doing this, it's kind of like a, a lucid dream in a certain sense. Who may you be? What do you represent? Well, he calls himself silence. Well, I kind of think that that's a little bit almost cheesy, to be honest with you, when I was first experiencing this. And I was like, well, I mean, is this really my subconscious? This is so cliche, you know, my name is Silence. It just kind of has smacks of, it smacks of just, I don't know, it just kind of hit me a certain way, like that cheesy feeling when you hear like a stupid joke or something. And I kind of thought, okay, maybe it's going to be ridiculous. But I went along with it. I was trying my best, in all honesty, to accept however my subconscious chose to manifest itself to it just accept it don't judge it don't say no i'm not doing this this is ridiculous no i was gonna do it i was gonna accept it my name is silence so i just went along i didn't judge him i didn't try to judge him at least and i just asked him are you part of me silence because i'm also wondering am i really you know unintentionally channeling right now <laughs> you know which I don't want to do for religious reasons. Well, he says, yes. And I say, why am I overcome by silence? Because at my job, I was just, and I get like this sometimes where I just have no desire to speak. You know, my job involved calling people all day, which drained the life out of me <laughs> as an introvert, especially. But I was so overcome by silence. So I immediately ask him, you know, I sense that this is a, this is something that probably has some root in my subconscious. Why am I overcome by silence? Also considering that he calls himself silence. So he's kind of saying, I have to do, I am that which has to do with what you're experiencing. The silence, not wanting to talk, being exhausted by speaking. So he's linking himself with my experience in the real conscious world, even though the subconscious world is real, but in the conscious world in which I was dealing with this, it was not like being catatonic, you know, in, in, in a clinical sense, but it almost kind of, it does feel like it. You don't want to talk, you know? I can go an entire day without speaking. Well, that was problematic for me during my job. So he has a long pause, which... Given his name, silence isn't surprising. He gazes at the sky. And so I, I ask further, like, you know, I'm, I'm seeking out this conversation. I'm not just going to let him not say anything. I, like, I'm demanding of my subconscious, like, hey, if you're real, like, don't just give me a couple lines. Like, if you're real, show me that you have your own thoughts. Show me that you really are sentient and that this isn't just some ridiculous joke or some foolish activity like am i really talking to a fully sentient part of myself 
So I asked him a question, because a question demands an answer. How can I care for you? How can we make amends, silence? He asked me, will you listen? And I say, yes, that's what I've come here to do. I want peace. The silence was conflicting with my life. That overwhelming desire just to be silent and to the exhaustion of speaking. And I want peace. He says, I'm not subject to you. We are come on equal terms. It's something I noted that Robert Johnson talks about this. And I say, I know, I accept that. And I really did. I, I really, I'm not trying to deceive my subconscious. I'm not trying to play games. I, I speak from my heart. I speak from my heart just any time, but most especially when I'm dealing with a part of myself and trying to see, will this actually work at resolving the conflict? I know, I accept that. So he says, I love my family. And it's kind of like he's answering my question in a, in a roundabout manner. And I say, so do I. He says, I love this land, which again, connects back to the whole theme of the farm the outdoors, the nature. I say, it is quite beautiful. Did you tend all this corn yourself? He says, I, which is kind of like an older way of saying yes, but it's also like, tells me that this is from a more archaic time, both in how he speaks and the fact that he, you know, did this all by hand without machine. He says, what do you seek? Or I say, what do you seek? Tending this corn, loving your family. Etc. Like, why are you saying I love my family? I love this land. What are you really seeking? Which is also anticipating a profound answer because I like if this is real, and I'm really talking to my subconscious, and it really is sentient. Excuse me, it really is sentient. It really does have its own thoughts. It should be able to come up with more than a one or two word answer. He says peace, and I ask further along that line, what is peace to you? And then comes the imagery of Eden. Eden, loving God and man. Before we get into this, I want to discuss this for a moment. Eden, and I'm just trying to think how I would put this. He seeks Eden. He seeks living, basically living as God intends. Living in right relationship to nature. Living in right relationship to other people. Living in right relationship with yourself, and then most importantly, living in right relationship to God. That's kind of what Eden entails. That's the imagery. That's kind of what's intuited by me as I'm going through this. When he says Eden, I kind of intuitively understand everything that I just told you. And later on in my active imaginations, this is, this is much more common, where Entire ideas are communicated almost, almost directly. You know, they, the, my subconscious doesn't need to give me a paragraph to explain an idea. It's almost as if it just beams the thought into my mind. It's like speaking through intuition. Like intuition is kind of viewed as like a sense perception in a certain sense or a personality trait, but it's kind of like the way you understand things. Intuitive people, it's, it's a mysterious thing where it's like you can see the thought, you can see the idea, and you see it apart from words. You can conceive of an idea and, and its nuances and all the little details about it without having then to write down a paragraph describing everything in words, every little detail. You see it all. Jung described intuition, and he described the creative process as highly linked to the subconscious. They proceed from the subconscious. They're energized by the subconscious. And that's why they're very mysterious. And yet, from his own, his own practice and his own experience with clients, I think he called them patients, but I don't remember clearly, he would say that there are some people who have like this intuition, you know, like that's just how they perceive things. Is It's not just something that occurs like, oh, I'm, in, I'm intuiting that, oh, my relative died, you know, 100 miles away. It's not anything mysterious like this. It's, I guess it would be associated maybe with thinking visually. You know, you, you, when you think, it's as if you see the ideas. And it's not seeing the literal words, but it's actually seeing the ideas themselves. So all that to say, when he said Eden, 
loving God and man. It's like all that about Eden was conveyed to me, but visually, intuitively, which is not surprising given what Jung believed about the subconscious as it relates to the creative, to the intuitive. He goes on, you thought I was ugly, so it knew, and I did my best. I didn't make a face, you know, as I was entering into the scene unfolding in my mind. I didn't, like, make a face or back away or, or like, you know, get startled when I saw him, even though he was, you know, haggard and had this air of, of like, a heavy darkness about him. Well, he knew this, and I didn't tell him. So at this point, I'm really like, okay, you know, whatever this is, it knows, it knows my mind. It knows what I feel and what I'm intuiting, what I'm perceiving, without me having to tell it, without me giving any evidence about what it is I'm thinking, what it is I'm feeling. So that confirmed this is coming from within my mind. It's coming from something that knows my mind. Something that's privy to every detail of what I'm thinking and experiencing, but without expressing outwardly. You thought I was ugly, so are many fair things. And there begins the pattern of, I guess it would be related to Young's wise old man. And this increases extremely as I go on. And in each session, you're going to see this happen. As my active imaginations go on, it takes on the character of the wise old man you know not necessarily in that physical form or in that representational form in my mind but it seeks to teach me it seeks to share things with me you thought i was ugly so are many fair things and that is a very wise saying like look beyond the outside look beyond the persona look beyond the external these things ultimately tell you nothing and you think, oh, I'm ugly. You know, what, is, what, you, what are all the things that you could judge based on the appearance of somebody described, but like this farmer that I've been describing to you? Many fair things appear ugly. And you can think of biblically, you can think of Paul when his critics said he's unimpressive to look at and his speech is contemptible, I believe is the word. His speech is contemptible and he's unimpressive. You know, he's ugly. He's nothing to look at, and his speech is his speech is nothing, you know? He's not a good orator. He's not eloquent. Jesus himself in Isaiah 53, where it says that people kind of turn their face away, you know? They, they didn't want to even look at him. It says that it, Jesus in Isaiah 53, he has no stately form or majesty that we would look at him, nor an appearance that we would take pleasure in him. He was despised and abandoned by men, a man of great pain and familiar with sickness, and like one from whom people hide their faces. And then it goes on, it was our sicknesses that he himself bore and our pains that he carried. He was pierced for our offenses, he was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment for our well-being was laid upon him, and by his wounds we are healed, and so on. But the point is, the external means nothing. Many fair things are ugly on the outside. And that wisdom really showed me, hey, you know, this isn't just like some, it's like not like an alter ego inside of me, you know, just like some simplistic facet of my personality that I was dealing with. But it showed me that this subconscious, it's almost like a repository of wisdom, not perfect, not infallible, but nonetheless, it, it had a perception, a very deep, and significant perception of life and the things of life. And that is what revealed that to me. So then I basically get to the point, just kind of get down to business. I have many things to attend myself. I seek peace too, but you are overwhelming me from my work and attaining peace. Silence is beautiful. Like, yes, isn't it nice to just be quiet and just listen to the trees and listen to the birds? But how can I be silent when I must work? which consumed, you know, most of my waking hours every day. I have to call people and talk with them all day. He says, nourish me like water nourishes this field, as if to say that he's been neglected. My conscious life impacts him, 
and my conscious life has left him neglected. So I, so I say, and if I do so, will you have peace and loosen your hold over me? Says I, yes. So I get down to business further. How may I nourish you? Like, be specific. And I was, I was being polite. I wasn't being rude or blunt. It can kind of seem that way on paper, can it? But I was basically genuinely wondering, okay, I hear you. How specifically do you want me to do this? He says, nature, quiet things. And gardening had been on my mind. And so thinking, well, maybe that's my subconscious, you know, and dreams and and intuitions. Maybe it was wanting me to garden. We had been thinking about this, planning on how are we going to landscape our new house? How are we going? What are we going to do? What plants are we going to put where? I say, gardening? And he nods. I say, well, that's an impasse for me, you know. I don't know about you, subconscious, if you understand that. I'm sure it does. But, you know, to garden, you need money for all the things of gardening. The stones, the bricks, the soil, the plants, everything. And for money, I must work and call. And then, to call, I can't be silent. In other words, this is the impasse. He says, I can help you with that. And I say, how? Nurture me during your work. I mean, realistically, if you're going to spend nine and ten hours a day on the phone, you know, I mean, what time does that leave for gardening? What time does that leave if it gets dark after you're done and it was dark when you started? How am I supposed to go outside? How am I supposed to enjoy nature before or after? So he wants me to nurture him during my work. So, okay, I say how. (laughs) Specifically, how. And that's both because I honestly wanted to know, yes, but I also wanted to see how deep is the subconscious, you know? Is it simplistic? Is it profound? What is it like? So I'm I'm inviting it to talk to me, like talk, you know? Like I don't want to be the one talking. And actually, you know what? Compared to this act of imagination, I talk very little in my future act of imagination active imaginations fun fact so he goes on bring eden into your home so while you're working he says open a window quiet classical music you know enriching uplifting music breathe deeply you know and well is this a perfect solution well probably not to be honest but that's about as good as you can do when you have to sit at a desk all day you know at least open the window Play a little classical music, which I could do, breathe deeply, and then I say, and this will get me to gardening, the long-term nurturing you. Will this nurture you? Will this solve the conflict within? And he nods. Will this get me to gardening? Because will this enable me to do the job, to earn the money, to get the things that we need to garden? He nods. I say, so I'm just kind of like trying to be like an active listener. I'm basically repeating what he said to make sure I understand. So you long for silence. You long for peace, tranquility. And the problem was my work. And he says, that is it. So I understood. I understood what he was saying. I say, and now, you know, I was convinced by now, like this is legit. So I'm kind of done with the, you know, asking the questions phase. And now I kind of bear my heart. And I say, honestly, I respect you and your values. I mean, it's a part of me, right? The subconscious. So I guess I shouldn't be surprised. But I admired him. I admire that he had a family. I admire that he was growing his own food, that he was doing his own thing with his own two hands. You know, out in the beautiful outdoors, loving the land, loving the nature around him, loving his family. You know, those are all things that I I hold very dear myself. I admire your work and I'm jealous of you, to be honest. Why? Because he could work outdoors. He could, you know, basically live the life of Adam as best as you can, I guess, in this fallen world. But he was able to be out there in the beautiful outdoors. And even if it's raining or something or snowing, there's a beauty in that too. He had that connection with the land. He had that connection with nature, that time to work and to think 
your mind isn't always going like it was with mine, you know, talking to someone on the phone. Your mind is spinning 24-7. Well, not literally, but you get the idea. Your mind is constantly going. You don't have time to turn your brain off and think about higher things. Think about life itself. He had that time, and I was jealous of him, to be honest. He says, you will have peace soon enough, my friend. Well, you know, the ironic thing is that actually didn't turn out. At least not in the way I was expecting. Because without saying too much, my health turned and I actually left the job. As a result, my health condition. And in a certain sense, there is peace now. You know, there is time to breathe. There is time to enjoy nature. And to cultivate that, I don't think he knew that. And I don't believe that my subconscious can predict the future. I believe there's only one who can predict the future. But I don't think that's what he was conveying. I think he was basically saying, well, if this is your attitude, you know, if we're going to work together and this is your attitude and your approach, well, you know, you're going to have that peace soon enough. And calling me my friend, you know, was endearing and was comforting to me. Letting me know, like, hey, how you're approaching me is is good. It's acceptable. It's it's beneficial. It's wholesome. You know, this relationship that we have, conscious and unconscious, is good. And so, toward the end, I say, please support me and help me to get there. That's all I ask, and I will nurture you with Thanksgiving. I will nurture you, comma, with Thanksgiving. I should say. It's not that I'm going to nurture him by being thankful. I'm going to nurture him by doing the things that he said. But I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do so thankfully that it brings resolution, that it brings that peace, hopefully. And I ask for his support, or really the support of my subconscious. Like, let's work together. Let's do this as a team. He said, I, or yes, it's good. So that was the end. And how did I know it's the end? Well, it's kind of like you have a conversation with someone and you both just kind of intuitively know, you know, the conversation's good and it's run its course and it's time to be done. And that's kind of what he conveyed to me here. And that's kind of what I conveyed to him there. We both knew it was over. And it's just kind of, I guess, if you understand, you know, this is a part of you. So it's not like this is some foreign, external being. If you kind of understand that, the, that this is about done, you know, then chances are it's also understanding that it's, it's about time to be done. Like the conversation or the session or the experience, whatever you want to describe it as, is done. It's run its course. It's accomplished what it should accomplish. And this whole thing, I should note, took about... I would say 40 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes, including the like time preparing, you know, with the invitation and closing my eyes and all that took about 40 minutes or so. How long did it take for me to narrate it as a video? Well, it took, well, five minutes. But the, the difference in time is, first of all, in the narration, it just unfolds line after line, you know, and when you're experiencing it's not just all just dumping out one after another start to finish it's not doing it like that because there is time like when he paused and gazed at the sky and every time he says something i write it down all that writing takes time because i'm hand writing and then i kind of close my eyes and kind of focus back the scene comes back into my mind just as it was before and then i have to think of what i'm going to say I say it, I wait for his answer, he says it, I write it down, and so that fills in the time. It actually takes longer than you think. This one may have took more like may have taken more like thirty minutes, but typically it takes me around forty to fifty minutes for an active imagination session to run its course. It takes almost no time, maybe two or three minutes to start. I sit down and within two or three minutes I can be seeing the scene unfolding. And then the rest is just basically writing as far as time consuming, as far as what is consuming the time. 
So I hope that this has been beneficial to you. Like I said, I'm going to be telling more. I'm going to have videos devoted to like, is this meditation? Is this channeling? And it's not. And how exactly is it different? Well, I'll be answering that. And probably of most of interest would be technique. How do you specifically, how do you do this? What exactly are you doing? How are you preparing? What does it look like while this is happening? How do you finish? I'll be answering that soon. That will probably be my next, my next psychological video will be about that. And I don't know if you know this before, I also do devotional stuff on this channel. And, you know, whether or not that's your thing, I also do gaming stuff. And that's, that's a lot of people's things, <laughs> the gaming stuff. I, I don't play the popular games. I don't sell myself out just because something's popular. Planet Side 2, that's first person shooter content from me. And then I play a bunch of other stuff. Like, um, I've yet to do stuff about the other things that I play, like uh, Stellaris, I play quite a bit. I do Cyberpunk as well, which I guess is a first person shooter, but it's not, you know, warfare isn't the idea, isn't the main concept. And then a bunch of other games, like random little games I'm going to be putting out. Like, um, I have one that just published about Majesty, the old game from the childhood of many of you or your young adulthood, perhaps. And then um, Stronghold Crusader. Yeah, I play that some. Maybe have other stuff like Galactic Civilizations, other games. Those are just my interests. And this channel was ultimately, unsurprisingly, just a reflection of me and my mind, my interests. And I'm just hoping that by sharing that, it's benefiting you in some way, whether by entertainment or by edifying you, as I hope this did, in a more like, more intellectual or more thoughtful kind of way. I wish you the best. If you like this, please thumbs it up, please subscribe, and I hope to see you back for the next video. Thanks for watching.